Okay, so the question is how to begin what you in, you know is going to be a very long novel, uh, essentially centered around the criminal justice system. So naturally, um, you know, the novel begins with the attorney and with something we call arraignments. And um, naturally, arraignment, the arraignment is the natural beginning of a criminal case. So that, that certainly lends itself to the beginning of what is going to be a, um, a long exploration of, of these matters. And it was the first thing I wrote um, with respect to the voices. I mean, they're voices of compelling people, uh, not because I wrote them in that way, because these people are compelling. I've been, you know, I, I, I'm easily bored, yet I've done this type of work, um, working as a public defender in the United States for, you know, 15 years. Believe me, a large part of it is because the people I represent are highly compelling individuals. Uh, I recently read an article by an attorney who essentially was answering a question that they had posed to themselves in, in some context I can't quite recall right now about why it is I do this kind of work, essentially talking about the kind of work that I do. And her answer was, I mean, hit the nail on the head for me, which is, you don't realize people in, uh, charged with crimes are, tend to be really interesting people. <laughs> they tend to be really the kind of people you want to sit down with and get to know. And certainly so at the outset. I mean, certainly when you first start doing this work, I mean, you're just grip, it's just gripping human drama. That's what I think you're reacting to more than any skill as a writer that I have, is the fact that these are gripping people with really gripping, interesting lives and have fun ways of expressing themselves. There's a lot of comedy in the job. You know, people think you're a public defender. Oh, that must be hard. Yeah, it's mostly hard. But you know what? I also laugh a lot. People say weird things. You t you're, you're agreeing to take on a kind of a skewed view of of human life where you are somehow aligning yourselves with the people who most people want to run the opposite direction from. So I think that's probably more, uh, I'd love to say it's my you know skill as a writer, but I'd, I'd say it's probably just that you're being exposed to people that you're not normally seeing depicted in these settings and novels and movies, etc. Or at least not accurately so. So there's about 15,000 public defenders in America, which is a remarkably low number if you think about it. Um, essentially, every public defender has in common the following. They will be assigned their client essentially randomly. They will not be paid by that client. They will be paid by a, you know, it varies, but they will be paid by a different, usually governmental source. And they will ag agree um, essentially to function as that person's attorney for the life of the case. So we spoke about arraignments being the beginning of a criminal case. You stand up next to the, the defendant as they get arraigned. They usually enter a plea of, of not guilty um, or, or sometimes enter a plea of guilty and the case is over. But uh, when we're talking about a case that lives for a while, they enter a plea of not guilty. You're that person's attorney. You are charged essentially with not giving them a fair trial, not seeing that they're treated fairly. No, you're charged with achieving the best possible result for that individual. You've essentially agreed to be that person's um, only protection, really, against, uh, as I said, what I've referred to before as this rather toxic machine that um, is especially in existence in the United States. So essentially the work is uh, can be difficult and mainly because if if there is this toxic machine and if it is growing exponentially and if you know the rate of incarceration has quintupled in a few decades what does that mean well that means you have a lot of clients obviously there's a lot of people being arrested and there's only 15,000 public defenders in the country and most people that are arrested can't afford a lawyer so essentially what 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 marks if, if you had to pick one salient feature of what it means to be a public defender in the United States, it's this feeling of being uh, deluged with work that you can't really quite get a handle on the way you would like. So for example, if, if, if you or your brother or sister were to be charged with a crime tomorrow with the possibility of being incarcerated and having their liberty taken, I would suspect that you would want every possible uh, rock turned over to see if there's anything that could possibly avoid this horrific result. Um, and I think that there's nothing wrong with that. And that's how the 70 to 80 people that I represent at any given time feel. And that's how they should feel. And that's how I feel for them. But um, I am one person and there are 80 people who want me um, exhausting every possible legal maneuver. And as you can see, there are only so many 
hours in the day and so what ends up happening is as I said the overwhelming sensation is one of being deluged um, with work that can't quite be adequately handled. Okay, so, you know, at this point it becomes important to define our terms a bit and know what we mean when we say the American criminal justice system. So, and, and, and I've made before this distinction between what we'll call criminal justice and what we'll call the criminal justice system. So, for example, if, if we call, if we define the system as what happens to an individual once they've been arrested in the United States and charged with a crime, that system in and of itself has some rather beautiful aspects to it, has some really counterintuitive yet remarkably uh, humanistic notions like, you know, you need to prove a crime beyond a reasonable doubt, the burden of the proof is on the state entirely, uh, you're presumed innocent once you're arrested. These are beautiful notions that, that, that may not be found in other systems and indeed aren't found in other criminal justice systems. So from that perspective, if, we, if, we, if when we say criminal justice system, we limit ourselves to that kind of consideration, then, then we're going to essentially conclude that, that things aren't all that bad. What happens, the problem in the United States is, is not so much that system as it is society in general's attitude towards what I'll call crime and punishment, towards what is the proper um, attitude that a society should have towards people who've broken the law, what, v what laws should be emphasized and aren't emphasized, what the police choose to um, emphasize. So I'm sure you understand that the United States essentially um, has declared a war on drugs for at least, you know, at least 30 years. I mean, I could even date it back 10 years more than that. Um, and essentially what's happened there because of this declaration of the war on drugs is, is it, it's all sorts of perversions have been created whereby the, the United States incarceration rate far exceeds that of other civilized countries and is something like seven times the incarceration rate, say, of Germany. So clearly, although what we'll call this, what I've defined as the system has these beautiful aspects to it. Something has gone wrong whereby an, an insane amount number of its citizens are being incarcerated. And I think that if we were going to, you know, essentially try to stamp out this injustice, I would think that the focus would have to go on these societal attitudes and these larger picture concerns about who it is that enters the system in the first place, what, what it is that causes someone to get arrested, and what our attitude is going to be towards that person once they are arrested. And these aren't things you can look up in a, in a book, you can look up, in a, you can look up um, in a criminal code. They're not written on paper. These are just essentially uh, a, a, a spirit of the society that has become damaged and has come to view certain people as dispensable and able to be incarcerated for extreme lengths of time. Yeah, it was it's thrilling to write it because if I've said earlier that the, the principal feature of the job is this feeling of oppression by number, right? Just so many things that, that should be being done, but you can't. So you're kind of like a doctor at an emergency room and some people have you know, a, a sprained ankle and other people are, you know, stroking out. <laughs> You're going to focus on the guy who's stroking out. I'm constantly focusing on the person whose problem is most immediate and most in front of my face. So that does give rise to the notion, well, man, this might be a lot more fun if I had one client. This might be, a, so essentially what Dane does is essentially reduce his caseload to one client. He only focuses on one client. And yeah, you'd be, if you think about it, unfortunately, the, the scary part of the job is when you think and say, well, is, is somebody right now incarcerated um, because I just couldn't do everything that should have been done? Because if you, and one of the things I think that uh, Dane's representation of Barnes highlights is what all we would do if, for example, it were us. And I think at some point, Kane, Cassie said, I, I couldn't stop talking. Uh, I was pretending to be the person who was going to be incarcerated. And under those circumstances, there was nothing I wouldn't say. So there's the whole notion of, unfortunately, there's a, a, a basic calculus to the whole thing, which is when you have 60 clients, when you have 70 clients. And by the way, I'm giving you 70 and 80, and those numbers are are worse um, for other public defenders. I'm giving you numbers. If there's a public defender listening to this right now, he's probably saying, one, I'd take 80 in a heartbeat. I got 140. 
and and and, and that's absolutely true. There are in in other parts of the country, not New York, um, there are public defenders with 120, 150 clients. And listen, basic logistical math, if you're willing to sit down and do it, there's just no way that no matter how dedicated, no matter how skilled that person is, and by the way, the average public defender is far more skilled at lawyering than the average member of the legal community, and I feel very confident in asserting that. And they're, they're generally of a far higher intellectual plane than the average attorney. So it's not a question of that person's ability. It's literally a question of you know, the way time passes and how you can deal with that as an attorney who has triple digit clients. So yeah, writing the Dane stuff was thrilling because we're like, this is what it would look like if an attorney as skilled as Dane really did have the proper time and resources. And a lot of times we see, essentially, when a high profile arrest occurs, at least in the United States, that we do see how the system would function if the person had an attorney who had all the time. Why? Because that attorney senses the ability to make a ton of money and make their name, and they essentially become uh, a, an attorney for one individual, essentially devote all their times to one client, to one case. And we get a, a small idea of what happens in, in those situations. All right, so the, the excessive detail uh, serves two purposes. One is it kind of punctures what is, what is a very imminent, with an A, uh, depictions of the American criminal justice system on television shows, movies, as you mentioned, uh, certain kinds of novels that are really superficial dealings with, with what is an, an, a huge body of human activity. So the the detail that you're referring to kind of punctures that a bit and saying, oh, so you're interested in the legal system. Let's see if you really are interested in the legal system. I'm going to bore you with the minutia of what it really is. So yeah, I did kind of uh, get a kind of subversive thrill out of saying, subverting these notions of the criminal justice system somehow being converted into mere entertainment. Now, the second purpose that it served, as I say, is that by focusing, for example, there's only one trial depicted in the novel, by focusing on what appears to be incredibly minor uh, um, crime, let's call it, you are highlighting the fact that you know, the definition of crime, what the average layperson thinks of when they think of crime, in many ways is, mis is misapplied, is, is, an, is a mistake, <laughs> in the sense that um, Americans are taught to think of crime as a person violently assaulting an innocent person and therefore they must be incarcerated in order to keep society safe. And certainly that kind of crime exists, obviously I don't deny that. And obviously what should happen to somebody who acts violently towards their fellow citizens is an important concern. What um, The point I'm trying to make by depicting what is a minor economic crime is that the overwhelming um, percentage of what gets labeled crime in the United States is not that. What, the, the overwhelming number of people filling prisons and jails in the United States have not committed any violence whatsoever. Um, they have essentially committed either purely uh, minor economic crimes, as you're referring to, or they've somehow been caught up in what, what we earlier referenced as this war on drugs, essentially engaging in behavior that, har if it harms anyone, harms themselves principally and mainly. So uh, the, the excessive detail, the, the focusing on these minor things, I think A, gives you a more accurate picture of what's really going on, and B, yeah, it does subversively, as you say, uh, puncture a hole, God willing, in this mass entertainment bull that's been perpetuated for decades at this point. Absolutely, I mean, American society is so, largely centered around pop culture and entertainment. It's, it's, the, it's the basis of the entire thing. So to the extent that you know this pop culture entity seeks to cast its light and focus on criminal justice, let's call it, yeah, to the extent that they are spreading um, incorrect uh, notions about what that system does and portraying for the eight millionth time prosecutors and, and police officers as the last heroic stand between you and anarchic violence, yeah, I get pissed off because it's, 
as I say, it's, it's simply verifiably, statistically untrue that the majority of people incarcerated somehow pose a danger to you or I as we're walking out at the latest fucking Broadway show that you paid $100 for. It, it's simply not the case. It's verifiably untrue. So yeah, do I get angry when I, when I see these perpetuations? I abs absolutely, because they are essentially um, feeding what is a mass machine that is built on a fallacy and shows like that even ones that are praised to high heaven as giving gritty realistic portrayals true to life even those shows are essentially full of it in the sense that they are conv essentially um placating american society to think it's not that we want to go after minorities and nonviolent uh, drug abusers. We have to. Otherwise, look what they would do to each other otherwise. Look what drug dealers are like. You want them prowling in your streets? Okay, let's go from 300,000 people in prison or incarcerated in 1979 to 2.3 million people uh, today.